It is good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. We're continuing the Gospel of John. This will be our 20th exposition of this book. We're going to be dealing with the first four verses of chapter 2. So after Jesus was baptized, Matthew says he was led up. He was led up by the Spirit of the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Mark says the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan and was with the, and was with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered to him. That's Mark. See, each of them had a little, little something to it. Now, Luke and John omit this, this temptation, which took place prior to the events of our text. Matthew says that when Jesus was, had heard John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. That's how he follows up the temptation. Mark says, after Jesus was, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Mark 1, 4. Now John is covering events that took place before John was cast into prison. John is still ministering during this text we have, see. So it's showing you the different, different uh, gospels, they just don't, follow the same, follow the same path. So they each take you a snapshot of that some don't give you. Mm -hmm. In other words, God assumes you're going to read all of them. Yeah, amen. <laughs> For a short period of time, John and Jesus were ministering at the same time. Mm -hmm. And some people told, you know, you know, John, Jesus is baptizing more disciples than you. What do you think about that? You know, and so there are some they were ministering at the same time. Mm -hmm. As late as the third chapter of John, Gospel of John, the Apostle John mentions the active ministry of John all the way up into that, that chapter. Now, John's ministry and Jesus' ministries were different, but they were compatible. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You can have difference if it's compatible. Mm -hmm. And they were different, quite different. Yeah. But they were very compatible. Even though some men tried to introduce competition, you know, he's baptizing more. Mm -hmm. What about that? Yeah. How are we going to build a John the Baptist church if the Church of Christ is growing? See, yeah. oh, see, see, this isn't this isn't a new thing. Yeah. <laughs> this competitive spirit. Yeah. Now the apostle takes. John takes us to an entirely different surrounding. Mm -hmm. we're going to, no one else covers this that we're going to cover it here tonight. We're being introduced tonight. John had declared Jesus in his pre-incarnate. Mm -hmm. yeah, nobody, nobody else did that. Uh -huh. I'm showing there that God didn't pour out the whole thing on anybody but Jesus. Yeah. He's the only one that had, had it all. Yes. Yes. It was doled out. Mm -hmm. And I think if, you, if we knew the uh, backgrounds and the people who these were written, you would find that these, each of these epistles addressed some needful perspective of Jesus that perhaps wasn't quite clear to the people they wrote to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you'll find that that's the case. In fact, that's, a, that's the case with all the Scripture, if you can see it. Uh, John knew that, uh, Jesus knew that John's ministry was drawing to a close, but yet he spoke highly, he spoke highly of him. Now we, John introduces us to Jesus, interacts with some other people that isn't mentioned in the other texts either, other gospels. He tells them about Andrew and the other we think was John. 
interfaced with those and, and with Philip and P Peter and then Philip and then Nathaniel. But in all of these things and in all of the records, you find that when it comes to Jesus, whether he's a babe in a manger or he's a baby being held by Simeon in the temple or he's a 12-year-old in the temple or he's at John's baptism, whoever he is, he's always the preeminent person. Don't make any difference how old he is, where he was, when it was. He always, the spotlight was on him. Amen. He always was the preeminent person. Wherever Jesus was found, that was the case. So if there's ever a place that represents itself as being aligned with Christ, but Christ isn't evident... He's not there. Yeah, that's right. There's no such thing as Jesus being unnoticed. Yeah, yeah, amen. Now you just check the scripture and see if this is true. They, people always know when he's around. They always know and we still always know when he's around. Amen. And when I don't sense Jesus and it's a religious environment, I put some distance between me and that environment yeah. for my own safety. No one's safety. I don't want to get, get the feeling sympathetic for people that have frozen out Jesus. I, I don't want to get the feeling sorry for people like that. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Because Jesus said too much about receiving himself. Yeah. Amen. So Jesus is never secondary. Yeah. Not even as an infant was he secondary. He wasn't in, secondary as a 12-year-old. He wasn't, no place was he ever secondary. Yeah. Never was. He was never upstaged by Mary yeah. or Joseph or John the Baptist or anybody else. Mm -hmm. He was always at the top. Amen. His presence and his word are never, never considered incidental. Mm -hmm. See, and I am I'm, uh, sadly report that I was part of a movement in which a segment of Jesus' life was incidental. And they didn't emphasize the Gospels. They always, they always glossed the Gospel. I don't care, historic or otherwise, they always glossed compared to what's there. And I'm, I rejoice to be freed from that kind of, a, kind of an environment. All right, now we're in John 2, 1 through 4. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Yeah. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Amen. Yeah, Mary wasn't offended by that. But if you're really sensitive, if you got thin skin, don't be, don't spend a lot of time around Jesus. If you're easily offended, you better not spend much time around Jesus. Yes. I think if you spend time with Jesus and you have a heart for Jesus, He will make you more humble and He can be able to receive yes, criticism. You've seen people, maybe you've been one yourself, who are really, really sensitive about what folk thought about you and all that. You got all up in the air if somebody give you a little trouble. Well, you got to really seek to be free from that. Amen. Yes. When you were talking about this, with Jesus being the premier person, no matter where he went, I was considering how uh, whoever comes into contact with Jesus, it's going to demand a response. Yeah, as well. uh, that's and right. He, he is the head of the corner. He's the cornerstone. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so you can either be built upon him, or you're going to stumble over him. But one of the two will happen. Amen. 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 He, when he was a baby, demanded a response. Yeah, that's right. huh? They worshipped him. The third, the third day, and the third, 
And the third, you know, the third day of creation is the first time life appeared. Mm -hmm. You probably thought about that already, but that's when the grass herb yielding seed, mm -hmm. fruit trees yielding seeds, he living things. The third day is when, was the first time there was something living, yeah. created. <laughs> and that's the same thing here. This is something, some evidence of life is going to be introduced here. Productivity, in other words, productivity. I understand this to be the third day after Jesus said words with Nathaniel. Uh, important, it's important once again to note that the attention is on Jesus, not on Nathaniel. It's a consistent factor in the entirety of the record God's given of his son. It's always yeah. consistent. Mm -hmm. He's always the focus of attention. Yeah. He's always the subject of discussion. Yeah. If he's involved with anyone, his words are the most important ones said. It's just consistent every place. Uh -huh. This is the way it is. Yeah. Jesus never quoted some other philosopher. That's right. Uh -huh. Sometimes he would quote someone God inspired, Moses said, or whatever. We never have an exception to this. He was talk we have records of Jesus talking to Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the lawyers, the high priest, the wealthy ruler, or, and Pilate. But the weighty words in all those discussions always belong to Jesus. Now, I don't believe that this view is commonly held by professing Christians. I don't think the average Christian believes that Christ's words are that weighty. You say, well, how dare you say something like that? Because they are too ignorant of his words. If you put weight on Jesus' words, if you assign significance to what Jesus said, believe me when I tell you, you'll be finding out what he said. Amen. Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they're going to judge you. Mm -hmm. that's right. that's if that's right. all I knew uh -huh. about what Jesus said, I'd want to be finding out what Jesus said. Amen. See, but people are not beating down the door to find out what Jesus Amen. said. Amen. Some people are more interested in what some other man has said. Uh, yes. What has Rick Warren said? What has uh -huh. Joel Osteen said? Well, like, who cares? Amen. We got a spokesman's been sent from heaven. Amen. God's speaking to us through his son, not through these people. Amen. Yes. There's actually religious people, or they call themselves that, that teach that Jesus' words are no weightier than oh, yeah, any other words of I know. They actually teach that to their members. Oh, yeah. I've had people say that. Yeah. Oh, you think the red print's more yeah. important, you know, and so forth. Well, let's take a moment and just uh, just, uh, re just give up uh, seven pers things said Jesus said about his words. Mm. About his words. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words yeah. Yeah. shall not pass away. Yeah. <laughs> well, so much for Jesus, what Jesus saying, being under the first covenant. Yeah. It passed away. Yeah. Uh -huh. Am I right? Yes, amen. Whosoever therefore should be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Yeah. So particularly in a, we're in a, you were in a uh, sinful generation, an adulterous and sinful generation. Now whoever is ashamed of Jesus and his words in that kind of generation now, Jesus meant this, brothers and yes, sisters. Yeah. He said, I'll be ashamed of him. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Don't think such a person is going to, like, get in. Yeah. That's right. That's it. We're talking about Jesus' words now, see? Here's something else. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. How about that? Yeah. Who else can say something like that? Here's another word, John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak, the words that I speak unto you, 
They are spirit. They are life. You want to come alive? Jesus' words make you alive. How about this? If ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples and dear. What about if you don't continue in his word? Then you're not really his disciples. And the prospects are very gloomy for anyone who's not his disciple. John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. See? My words. Here's John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him make our abode with him. See, so his words, very, very weighty. So Jesus is going to say some words. He doesn't have to like say a lot of words. It isn't like his words are weighty if there are several paragraphs. His words are weighty if it's just very short, very brief. Where is your faith? Yes, well, Jonathan the perfect example of saying a lot with a few words. That's yeah. right. He, Amen. Yeah, he demonstrated that very yeah. well. Okay. That's right. Brother Gibbon. Yes, Brother Silas. God tells us that we should, that under the law, we should keep every jot and tittle of it. So mm -hmm. if that's true with the law, yeah. it's even more true with Jesus. That's, that's right. right. Amen. Amen. Uh-huh. On the third day, there's a marriage. Now, how's this for God having an eye for things. Think all the things going on at this time. There was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Now you may think that God would never see something in Joplin, Missouri. <laughs> We're being introduced to God here. There was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. It became important because Jesus was there. Coincidentally, Nathaniel was from Cana of Galilee. Mm -hmm. John 21, 2 tells you that. So they, they, the fellow he's just talking to. Mm -hmm. So this suggests to me that Jesus somehow went, got back with Nathaniel, and, they, you know, he was in the city where Nathaniel was from. Mm -hmm. This takes place in his hometown. Might have been some of more of his relatives mm -hmm. or some friends that he'd been there with. And only John mentions Cana of Galilee. This city's not mentioned in Moses, the prophets, or any other, any other place in the Bible. John's the only one that mentioned it. Which means there's a lot of stuff Jesus did that aren't even written. In fact, John said if they were all written, the world couldn't contain the books. You only find a few times that Jesus was even asleep. Just a few times. Never ever says he had a good night's rest, doesn't he? Ever says he was on the go all the time. There was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. That's a city where Jesus healed a nobleman in John 4, 46 and 54. And that miracle is called his second miracle. So the first two miracles were in Cana of Galilee. It's going to say this is the, at the end of this account, it'll say this is the first first miracle Jesus did and showed forth his glory. Mm -hmm. Gabriel was sent there, sent to Mary. Says it says his mother Mary was there. His mother, that's how important Jesus is, that even if his mother's there, it's significant. Yeah, yeah. The mother of Jesus was there. Mm -hmm. She's called his mother six times mm -hmm. in Scripture. She's honored among women. Yes, I'll tell you, Blessed art thou among women. Yes. She's called the one of whom Jesus was born. Matthew 1, 16. I know some people have overemphasized that. I guess they've overemphasized that. They worship her. That's where it's yeah. overemphasized. Yeah. But a lot of others have underemphasized it. Uh -huh. There you remember when she visited with Elizabeth, she delivered a stirring prophecy. While she is with Elizabeth, it is worth uh, musing upon. Mm -hmm. 
quite possible Mary was a relative of some of the persons that were in that area. We read about Mary's sister. She had a sister named Mary. And she kept company with Mary, the wife of Cleopas, as one of those, that man on the road to Emmaus. And she kept company with Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, out of whom she cast, Jesus cast seven devils. The company these people kept. See, I want you to always, <laughs> always pick up on the kind of company. Some of us, if you, some of God's people, I don't like to think of them in context of their friends. <laughs> But you could with these people. Yeah, right. You could think of these people within the context of their friends mm -hmm. yeah. and the people they made associations with. That tells you something about them. See, a lot of people have too many worldly friends. Right. They may say they're trying to win them, see, but I don't, I don't believe them. Mm -hmm. I, I just discard that. Some of them wouldn't be their friends if they're trying to win them. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm for it if they are trying. I understand. I'm for that. Yeah. But... It's just interesting when you take note of these people, they didn't have Gentile friends. Uh -huh, yeah. And if they were, they were Gentiles that like build them a synagogue or something okay, like that. Yeah. See, this is the kind of associations these people, these holy people made. Uh -huh. now, she was uh, one of the first women at the tomb. Mm -hmm. And she was with the disciples after Jesus went back to glory. And in the early church, she was praying with the brethren. Yeah. They gathered together together. The thing in particular stands out to me here is the manner of these earlier, earlier followers of Jesus, their manner, how they selected their friends, who they were with at, the, at times they had were choosing. So this was just not a display of sectarianism is that these people, once they were in contact with Jesus, they tended to kind of gravitate to each, to each other. We're seeing the closeness of uh, associates of Jesus beginning to form. There's a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Now God's going to do something at this marriage. That's why he brings this. There are probably marriages in a lot of other places too, but this one here, God's going to do something. I heard something of interest. Both Jesus and his disciples were called yeah. or bidden, came as guests. Jesus and his disciples or his followers. A disciple is like an apprentice. He's been trained to work with the one that's teaching him. It's a, In a broader sense, he's a follower of one he adheres to them intellectually, spiritually, thinks like they do, is being trained by them for work associated with them. A disciple of Christ may now be defined as, this is from McClintock's and Strong's, as one who believes his doctrine, the one they follow, believes his doctrine, rests upon his sacrifice, imbibes his spirit, and imitates his example. That'd be every disciple. So Jesus and his disciples were called or invited. Now this isn't the twelve. Twelve haven't even been chosen yet. They're not chosen until considerably after this. His disciples. Luke records the choice of the disciples, the twelve, as taking place after he healed a man with a withered hand which is some time after this. Matthew says he went about, Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease. And then after that, he chose his, the 12. Mark says that it was after he'd been thronged by the multitudes that he went up into a mountain and called unto him whom he would, and they came to him and he ordained 12. See, that's that. So this, this is not the 12. They hadn't even been called yet. The disciples must have been Andrew and John and Peter and Philip and Nathaniel. That's the only ones we know at this time mm -hmm. yeah. whom John has covered. So Jesus and five men, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as far as we know. 
these be this being true, this teaches us that these men like stayed with Jesus. They identified with him, became followers of him. They were so close that whoever Jesus, whatever Jesus invited, they were invited too. <laughs> They were devout men. All of these men were devout men. When they confronted Jesus, they were devout men, and they became his disciples. They previously were followers of John the Baptist. They'd followed the best teacher that existed before Jesus. Through his preaching, he'd prepared them to recognize Jesus. Amen. <laughs> John the Baptist prepared people so when Jesus turned up, they knew who it was. Boy, you want to pick up on... Uh, you want to pick up on this. If there's a single deficiency in the nominal church of our day, it's this. It's not enabling people to recognize Jesus. And that is serious when you say you're one of his followers. And people are confused about who Jesus is. And they're following the wrong people. And they're listening to the wrong people. See? This is bad. This is bad bad. These are unfaithful people, whoever they are, whatever their credentials are. If a person says they're one of Christ and they don't lead the people to recognize Christ when he's there and to recognize his will when it's said and to recognize who Jesus is, these people have lied. They're not representatives of Jesus at all. They haven't been sent by God at all. Some say, well, that's pretty strong. Yeah, well, it's intended to be strong. Amen. John the Baptist was sent by God Amen. to prepare the way. Amen. And we don't have any knowledge of anybody connected with Jesus that was sent by God that had nothing to do with preparing the way and making Jesus more understandable and more quickly discerned. We don't have any record of anybody God sent that was divorced from that. And Jesus told his disciples, he said, you're my witnesses. Wherever you preach, people are going to know about me. Amen. They're going to be able to pick, they hear something about me, they'll be able to pick up on the truth. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. If you don't get anything else done but that, that mm -hmm. that's a big item. Yeah. That's a big tick mark in the kingdom of God, that as a result of your ministry, whatever it is, and wherever it takes place, it's got to make Jesus more discernible, more recognizable. You've got to be able to pick up on it quicker, like, like those who followed John the Baptist. This is why people, this is why people have to resort to programs, procedures, routines, methods, created by men. This is why they have to do this. You've got to see this. It may sound hard on some people, but I don't really care about that. The reason people rely on these extraneous methods, methodologies is because they don't know about Jesus. There isn't anything that God has that's not in Jesus. You're complete in Christ. See, everything you need is in Christ. If, and you've got to go someplace else to get it. It's not even connected with Christ, and the curse of God is upon it. That's right. Amen. See, since Christianity has been institutionalized, true followers of Christ are very rare. And you already know yourself when you see one, what it does, it lightens your heart and cheers your spirit when you see someone that is. Real disciples are clearly described. Herein is our love made perfect that ye may that is, is herein is our love made perfect that ye may be bold that ye we may have boldness on the day of judgment because because as he is 
so are we yeah. in the world. Yeah. See, so that, <laughs> that says it all. So when they called Jesus, they called his disciples because as he was, so were they. It mm -hmm. was obvious these people go, wherever Jesus goes, these people go. Yeah. You can't have Jesus and not his disciples. Right. I'm sorry, you can't. You can't. Mm -hmm. Jesus won't be a private Jesus to you. Yeah. He will not. Mm -hmm. he, takes his, he brings his disciples with him when he comes. See? Well, they knew this. So Jesus came with his disciples. Yeah. He does not ordinarily come to anyone without bringing his disciples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. This shows the absurdity of rejecting the teachings of Paul. Yes. Because yeah, I mean the way you said that though, yeah. you can't have Jesus and his disciples. These are people sent into the world by Christ Himself. That's mm -hmm. right. So it's the same as rejecting Him if you take out, you push them out. In fact, Jesus said, "Whoever rejects you rejects me." Yeah. Whoever rejects me rejects him that sent me. So that's how, that's how it works, see? Amen. Jesus is accompanied by his disciples. In fact, his followers are called his body. <laughs> you, can't, you can't get any closer than that. They're called his body. Yeah. The body of Christ. In fact, it's so close we're called of his flesh and of his bones. Uh -huh. In Ephesians 5.30. The Savior joined to the Lord and are one spirit with him. So Jesus and his disciples, that makes perfect sense, you know, to me. Jesus even said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I. Yeah, that's how close, that's how close Jesus is with his, his disciples. And when the day of judgment comes, Jesus is going to say to the Father, Behold, I and the children that thou hast given me, see. That's be the ultimate association there will be. So Jesus and his people intentionally go together. Now, I don't know what the motives were for the people that asked him and all this, but I'm just saying that's the way God set this thing up. You can't have Jesus without having his disciples, too. That's why wherever Jesus went, his disciples, they were, they were with him all the time. The only exception would be if he went up on a mountain to pray alone, and that wasn't like all the time. So there it is, the, the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus is there. And she was so close to Jesus, they called Jesus and his disciples. They asked him them to attend too. Now this whole event was orchestrated from heaven. You don't want to miss that. This whole thing is being governed from heaven. We know this is the case because Jesus said, we know this is the case because Jesus said, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. And what things ever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Mm -hmm. He's going to do something at this wedding feast. That's right. Again, he said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. So whatever he does here mm -hmm. is not going to be because of a circumstance there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What he does here is going to be because this is his Father. Yes. So now, now they, they identify a circumstance arises. They wanted wine. Doesn't mean they, they lusted for wine. It means they ran out. In fact, the New King James says they ran out of wine. The wine gave out. New American Standard. The wine was gone. The NIV. The wine failed. Revised Standard Version. There was not enough wine. Wine was deficient. Fell short, wine supply ran out. Natural resources, even refined ones, run out. That's right. yeah. man, can't re man cannot create anything that is endlessly self-perpetuating. Yeah. That man can't do it. Whatever man makes has to be refurbished, resupplied, that's, there's a sense in which everyone really knows this, even though many live as though that's not the case. They live as though what man makes can just go on in and no, it runs out. They have no wine. Now, Mary knows enough about Jesus to so know she can tell him this. She doesn't tell him what to do. She just says, 
They have no wine. She already knew he could do things nobody else could do. Now, how she knew this, I, I don't know. But there's a lot of traditions, you know, about miracles Jesus worked before. But the Bible says this was the first miracle is recorded here. It was the first one he did. But somehow Mary knew. She was limited. The people at the marriage feast are limited. The head of the feast is limited. But she somehow knew that her son wasn't limited. They have no wine. You kind of get the impression that even though he didn't need to do a miracle, he was still not limited in what he could do. That's right. Uh -huh. I'm not limited. To deal with the situation. Amen. Yeah, you, it's kind of between the lines. You can kind of see that she kind of knew. She knew this. I don't know why people don't know it today. Well, I do know why. I'm just being polite. But to not know this today, this is inexcusable. To treat Jesus as though he couldn't do something about anything. See, this is wrong. Now, don't, Mary doesn't ask, present a solution. She just says they don't have any wine. She doesn't say, here's what to do. She doesn't tell him that. Jesus' mother, the Bible, Living Bible says, Jesus' mother came to him with the problem. Yeah. That's all she said. Be like us saying, Brother Given can't find a job. They did. To go. Yeah. As a difficult lesson to learn here, we do not need to present possible solutions to the dilemmas we face. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Often it's best just to state the circumstance yeah. and let it go. Amen. I do understand that there are times that we order our cause, as Job would say, and bring forth our arguments. There's times like that too. I understand there's times like that. But there are times when our minds are not able to place solutions on the table of reason. We just, we don't know what is best to do. Doesn't mean prayer can't be made for the situation. It just means we don't know what the solution is. Sometimes the situation doesn't make sense, you know. And all we can say is like Habakkuk said, he said, uh, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, yeah. uh -huh. than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon that deed of treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devour the man that's more righteous than he? You know, I know that you, <laughs> I know that you can't tolerate this, see, so, but he didn't have a solution. He just, he just said what he did know. Yes. Well, what's Jesus going to say? After all, the commandment says, honor your father and your mother. This was his mother. Yes. He says, woman. Must have been humbling to have Jesus say, to, for Mary to hear this. Yeah. Uh -huh. Woman. Yeah. That's what he said to his mother. Woman. Yeah. What have I to do with thee? Mm. <clears throat> Other versions say, what does your concern have to do with me? What, 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 are you, what are you telling me about this for? Why do you involve me? The NIV says. What concern is that to you You and me? We're both here, but we're not here to make sure that they have enough wine. What have, I, what have you to do with me? Basic Bible English says, this is not your business. What, what, are, you, what are you doing to get involved in something like this? Why should that concern me? Why are you saying this to me? Do not try. Here's a good speech says, don't try and direct me. Don't be telling me what to do now. You must not tell me what to do, contemporary English version says. The Amplified Bible says, dear woman, what is that to you and me? What do we have in common? Leave it to me. I do you think I don't know about this? Now this passage can be attended with some difficulty, I understand. But I take it just uh, 
just as it says. In other words, God's running this. Uh -huh. Jesus knows it, but she, she doesn't. She does look at that from the standpoint of Jesus' ability. Mm -hmm. But Jesus knows this isn't even a matter of having to do with my ability. This, this is because I could, I got all power, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. This thing is being governed by God. Jesus knows it. Mary doesn't know it, but she's willing to mm -hmm. let it go. Yeah. That. You say that Mary doesn't need to be concerned about this. Don't. Don't. In our words, don't get in a dither about this. Mm -hmm. All the bases are covered. It seems to me that Jesus is saying his agenda is not driven by human need. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't like jump into action because of what I see. Yeah. Yeah. I jump into action according to what God tells me to do. I only do That's right. what I see the Father do. And if he's not doing anything here, I'm not going to do anything here. Uh -huh. But if he is, I, I don't need to have a word from you uh -huh. yeah. to move me into action. Mm. That takes a lot of faith to operate like that, but you, you can do it. See, he's more sensitive to God than he is to his mother. I could get in some trouble here, I understand, but you've got to get to the point where you're more sensitive to God than you are to the people that you love. You've got to get to that point. Because sometimes what you think is out of control is not out of control at all. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So he elaborates some to his mother. Mine hour is not yet come. Okay, so. It's going to come shortly after this. His hour is going to come. Yes. It wasn't yet. He's not, he's not going to be moved into action by what his mother tells him. He's going to be moved into action by what his father mm -hmm. tells him. And he, to he told the people this. Yeah. Let them know that this is, this is, I work when my father says to me to work. Yeah. I speak when my father says that I should speak. Uh -huh. Not when you say. Mm -hmm. Amen. Sometimes that's a, it's a challenging lesson to learn, but everybody's got to learn that. Yeah. Sometimes you may see ahead of time something needs to be done. Mm -hmm. You may see that ahead of time, like Mary saw something ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the time was governed by what, Amen. what God said. Mm -hmm. My time's not yet come. It isn't my time for miracles, mm -hmm. the Living Bible says. The time for me to act has not yet come. But God's going to move them <laughs> almost immediately, I guess. I guess God's going to move them to do something. In other words, there's teeth. This, this prayer has a lot of teeth in it. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So how is it done when God moves to be done? This is how it's done in heaven. When God says, this is the time, that's the time. And until he says, this is the time, it's not the time. Yeah. <laughs> Even though you may have seen it ahead of time, like the prophets, they were given to see things ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They wanted to probe into it. Said, this isn't the time. God told them, this isn't the time. This isn't for you, see. Mm -hmm. This isn't for you. You're, I'm after you speak these words for people hundreds of years after you. Yeah. Uh -huh. Maybe some thousands of years after. Mm -hmm. That's how God is. So when you see something ahead of time, don't think it's a, it's a signal to you to, to get something done about it. Mm -hmm. may, it may not be. Yeah. Just like here, it may not be. Mm -hmm. Jesus may have to say, look, what, what are you bringing this up for? Mm -hmm. Just let the thing go. Just, just state the case and let it go. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Yeah, you can do that. You can be close enough to God that there could be some serious things going on and you can just say, I'm going to let my request be made known. I'm just going to 
Let it go. Then there's sometimes God will give you something to do about the situation. So you won't let it go. But God's governing the, the situation. As it works out, the desired effect will not take place among his people until God mandates it. Now here's the way, we, we must not yield to the temptation to make our circumstance a primary issue. See, you've got to come to that point, brothers and sisters. Where the issue, it may be a pressing issue, it may be something that's broke your heart, maybe something you don't see how you can continue, but you can't let your circumstance be the thing that drives the kingdom of God. Yeah, amen. You've got to submit to thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that involves when and where as well as what. You must be able to say, Thy will be done on earth. That's what we're asking. Yes. Yeah, um, I was going to say, Jesus isn't a genie, so you can't say, mm -hmm. I want you to do something, and he does it. It's, Jesus does things as God um, allows him to do it. So mm -hmm. he, you can't just say, I want this done, and he'll do it. He'll do it if it's God's will for it That's to right. happen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And part of faith is being able to trust him if he says, what is that to me? That doesn't mean I'm not going to do anything about this. That's not what that means. That means I'll act when it's appropriate. Yes, Sister D. This is, it's like Jesus giving her some relief here. Because she doesn't have to be like the one making the making this happen. Mm. So like the Lord is um, calming her as well because mm -hmm. he's 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 only doing the will of the Father when it when it's when it's mm -hmm. deep. But I was also thinking how right afterwards though so she it's like she, she accepts it. She knows. She yeah. un she understands it. But then she turns to the disciples right afterwards yeah. mm -hmm. and says, Listen to him yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we can see that she received it. <laughs> and see mm -hmm. He's not, he's not going to do it so everybody there knows. Mm -hmm. There's only going to be two groups of people that yeah, know yeah, what he yeah, does, yeah. the servants mm -hmm. and his disciples. Yeah, yeah. They're going to be the only people at this feast that know what happened. Yes. Yeah. It's because God, did, God wasn't going to do this mm -hmm. for everybody at the yeah, feast to see. That. He was going to do this for his disciples. Mm -hmm. And so the servants who normally weren't involved in anything. They were normally just servants. He's going to let them be the first ones yeah. to know. <laughs> that's, that's God. That's how he works. So yeah. uh, you've got to be able to associate these things with your own mm -hmm. circumstances. Sometimes the important thing is not for you to know. Sometimes the important thing is for the servants to know. <laughs> Maybe there's somebody else that needs to see yes. God's hand. Yes, yeah. Sister Barb. Just thinking about this, that there are times whenever um, I, as a parent, have been thinking about something and had everything worked out yeah. the way it needed to be. And then as we're walking through this, sometimes yes. my children see things yeah. and they're alarmed because they see something that they didn't realize a provision had already been made for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then, whenever you can calm their fears, you just say, it's taken care of. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like the Lord is doing this because Amen. he was at that wedding because the Lord had already been working. Amen. I remember mm -hmm. the disciples and Jesus came one day upon the blind man. And the disciples said, who sinned? Was it this man or yeah. his parents? He said, neither. Yeah. It was for the Lord's work to be That's made right. known. Yeah. So he had already been working and That's setting right. up this circumstance. Amen. For the work he was prepared to do, and it was all taken care of. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes you may experience this. Sometimes God will do something that's quite frankly very astounding, but it's only because of a few people he wanted to see it. <laughs> Most of the people at that marriage had no idea. Some of them thought that thought it was a deliberate move of the person that had the feast. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. They thought it was something he did. So see that 
So God doesn't always want everybody mm -hmm. to get the word. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's key people yeah, that's right. yeah. that He's going to encourage. Sometimes, some only only Peter knew where he got that coin out of a fish's yeah. mouth, and it's just the kind of thing that you probably wouldn't be talking about all the time, but yeah. that's who needed to know. Yes, amen. Sometimes God will work mm -hmm. just so you'll know. Mm -hmm. It's not something public at all. Yes. You wonder why. Why didn't other people see that? Because it wasn't for them, see? Yes, amen. Yeah, it for, does things that only you and him know. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, only a few people knew at this time, but <laughs> Well, the Holy Spirit has made it known to godly people all the way to now. Yeah. But even today, there's some people that still don't know this. I know it. Mm -hmm. It's right here. I it's, know it. it's very public, but still people don't know about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You remember uh, when Paul was going to... Uh, Rome, according to a word Jesus delivered to him, says, you're going to bear witness to me in Rome. Jesus appeared to Paul and told him he is going to go to Rome and preach. Then when he's on his way, he was going as a prisoner. The brethren tried to stop him because they didn't see the whole picture. But finally they saw it was the right thing to do, and here's what they said, Acts 21, 14. The will of the Lord be done. When they saw, they couldn't change his mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had enough presence of mind to know, well, then something more is involved here than what we see. The will of the Lord be done. That's, that's what Jesus was saying to Mary. Amen. Yeah. He was saying the will of the Lord. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say any more about this because I'm, I'm, my agenda is not driven by what my mother says. Mm -hmm. It isn't. The, Judah. the Lord is tried and true <clears throat> through history. He's proven to do what He said He was going to do. And a lot. So, sometimes men may may wonder why why isn't this happening? But it will all happen in God's time. Amen. Mm -hmm. God's not maneuvering, positioning what He's doing around mm -hmm. how men think it should be no. done. Mm -hmm. God's going to do what He's going to do, and no one's going to hinder it. Mm -hmm. Now this. This is something that is, is easy, relatively easy to talk about. But I to live by it. That, yeah. that's, right. uh -huh. that's something else. Yeah. But that's what we want to be experts in living. Yes. So we can live with yeah. these things in mind. That mm -hmm. What we see may appear a crisis. Mm -hmm. But God doesn't see crises. With God, there are no crises. Mm -hmm. right. See? Amen. Crises are just for people that don't know everything. That's why it's a crisis. <laughs> but when you can camp your... But faith, of faith can get hold of this. Amen. And you can say to yourself, this thing is... Looks very bad. They've... I mean, this is a wedding feast and they run out of wine. I mean, this... This can look like it's really bad. Yeah. Yeah. But you've got to be able to say, well, mm -hmm. what have I to do with thee? You know? <laughs> this can't be as bad as it looks. Yes. And if it is, yeah. God already knows about it. In the Bible, I, I think <laughs> a lot of people would say, well, that would just be so trite. Jesus would never turn water into wine. That's, yeah. that's just like so common. Yeah. But see, this was he was his father was showing something, yeah, yeah. revealing something about Jesus, and you know, and I've heard so much strange doctrines created from this account, like it's proving that God wants us to drink wine, <laughs> justifying the drinking of alcohol. Yeah. You know, when this so they missed the whole thing that happened even then. <laughs> yes, yeah, it uh well there. Yeah, sometimes making the request, the answer will come like as you're making the request. So you could be alarmed by something and and over, you know, misassess it and be all worked up about it. And as you make your request, then the, the presence of the Lord could, 
you know, it'll bring it to light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it uh -huh. can change your request as you're making it. Or also being being in the presence of the Lord, you could actually you you be um, on just a moment ago you could have been in in real straits over something and not understanding and bewildered over something and as you come into the presence of the Lord and make the request then the answer becomes obvious. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there, there's some of the the rewards in in uh, in everything with prayer and supplication. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Anyone else? Well, there's a lot. There's a lot here, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. To be anxious for nothing. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, for the way He spoke. We thank you for the faithfulness of these gospel writers. You moved them along by the Holy Spirit, and they did what they were to do. And now we know things we would not have known otherwise. So we thank we thank you that you have worked, so we could believe, so we ourselves could believe. Mm -hmm. You've left a testimony that has helped us, and we're we're thankful for it and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.